Hello, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, live and um, online um, to learn more about uh, Fast Tracking Founders, uh, which is a really uh, unique uh, program uh, that allows um, uh, professional engineering students to participate in a competition um, in the spring semester and um, um, gets um, the winners um, reimbursed for the fees associated with uh, filing a provisional patent. Um, I um, am joined today uh, by um, Halala Shayaste and uh, Tarek Zodi, um, who um, come in um, and um, share momentarily. Um, also, um, it's great to see Capstone teams in the audience. Um, I know some of you are joining um, uh, after the fact online. Uh, we're here to um, answer any questions that you may have. We're really excited about the program. It's going to be the uh, second, um, um, second year that we're running it. And I think that the structure of today's um, uh, session is uh, for uh, Tarek to say a few things about the competition and experience with the competition last year. Uh, then I'll pass it on to uh, Lale, who I believe will uh, treat us to a more general um, uh, talk about intellectual property before going into the specifics around documentation that you will need to submit. Um, if you do file, um, if, if you do win and you file a provisional patent, um, if you don't win, it's also great to know um, what is required when you file a provisional patent. It's a great skill set to have. Uh, and um, uh, I also very much hope that we'll spend as much time as possible answering um, your questions because this is um, what um, it's all about. Um, Tarek, would you like to say a few words? Sure. So uh, part of the genesis of this program was that, you know, over the last 10 years of having the MEng program, there were a variety of extremely entrepreneurial projects that we thought were a pity that they weren't taken to the next level uh, in terms of being possibly spun off into a company or some type of technology that the students could benefit from. So over the years, we've been toying with exactly how to do this. And Approximately two years ago, we finally got to the point where we uh, were able to uh, assemble all of the moving parts on campus to allow this to occur. And essentially, it's it's somewhat like the the uh, show uh, Shark Tank, where essentially what we want students to do is to come in, make a presentation to a team of evaluators, and the team of evaluators can give a quick thumbs up or thumbs down on whether this is a technology that they believe could be uh, something that's viable commercially. So of course, it's not going to be brutal as the theater of uh, Shark Tank, but nonetheless, it's going to be something where we make a careful assessment whether such a technology could go forward. So it is open to everyone uh, in the MNG and MTM and uh, MDES programs, any professional master's programs. Uh, the one key caveat is, is the, of course, the instructor of record for your capstone, as well as a company rep to make sure that it's it's all in the clear, you should confirm with them to make absolutely sure that they feel comfortable with you doing this if the project progresses to that point. Because of course they have a say in whether they want such a thing to be commercialized or not, or perhaps they already have some pre-commercialization strategies already in the wings. And uh, but it's good for you know you to check with them. So the, the main points as you start to progress this semester and early next semester is whether you would like to be part of this thing, this first step, you get the clearances. Number two, uh, making a pitch, and Alex has a couple of previous uh, winning examples uh, on display for everyone to see. And then if you do win, what do you get? Well, Lala and Alex will talk a little bit more about that, but there is a financial backing of the University of California to help pay for your legal fees and filing fees so that you can actually file for a patent. So I think that's the key part. So I'll throw the thing back to Alex and that, that was more or less uh, at least how I see things. Thank you, Tarek, and um, I'll pass it on to Lale. Awesome. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, pleasure to meet uh, the new cohort. Um, I'm Lala Shoyeste. I work at the Technology Licensing Office at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm Director of Administration and Associate Director of Licensing. Um, I think um, the program that uh, this team started, Tarek and Alex actually started, um, is an absolutely awesome program and I'm really privileged to be part of it. So I wanted to um, speak with you today a little bit about intellectual property and I'm going to zoom right through it because let me see I'm trying to share my screen let's see there you go can you see my screen everybody can okay awesome um, and I'll zoom right through it because I want you to ask questions um, more than I do the talking for you to ask the questions because that then helps all of us to get on the same page um, as to what happens next or what steps to take as you're in this program. So basically, but let's go through what intellectual property is, how we can protect it, what the patent process is, what the costs are, and what strategies we take with the portfolio, and then finally licensing. Hopefully, you will get to a place where you will either want to grow your business or you may want to, as, as taking all the IP for yourself, or you may want to license some of the technology that you have developed to another entity for, for portions of it uh, to help you manufacture, for example, or what have you. All right. So first of all, what is intellectual property? As far as I'm concerned, you know, for putting all the verbiage aside, it's whatever is between your two ears, right? It's what you see is privileged to have, right? It's um, all types of scientific and technical information, know-how, uh, materials, procedures, compounds, designs, software, works of authorship, invent. So there is a lot of ways that uh, we try to protect IP. Anybody tries to protect IP. One of them are trade secrets and know-how, which means keeping things to yourself. I'll, I'll go through each of these um, in a little bit more detail. Um, then it's copyrights that protect um, expression, but not ideas. And then trademarks that protect a brand and patents that protect inventions. And finally, also agreements. So trade secrets and know-how is information that usually is not known within the trade or industry, but um, universities don't keep trade secrets or know-how because we publish everything. That's our job. That's our mission, uh, education and publication. Um, but since we are all on here, can somebody uh, tell me a trade secret that you may know of? Like what is a really, really, um, famous trade secret. Can I see the chat? There you go, Coca-Cola, exactly, good job. <laughs> that's, that's an awesome one, yes. Um, so, so we don't, as I said, we don't keep trade secrets and we publish everything. Now, oh, where am I? There you go, okay. Then we have uh, trademarks, which are words or symbols that um, are associated with goods or services for an entity, distinguishes them from those who, um, from the stuff that are manufactured or sold by others. And it's, you know, very important uh, to keep a trademark once you have a business, right? So you will not be confused with someone else. So what I always tell people is if you're going to be applying for a trademark or choose a name for yourself, um, you may want to do a little bit of, you may want to spend a little bit of time looking out there to see that somebody else doesn't have a really, really close mark or name. Um, because not only will the names or marks be confused, but also they may come after you for, um, for using a mark that is really close to their original mark. Another type of IP is copyrights, which um, protects authors of original works of authorship. For example, software, literary works, artistic works, that are in a tangible form of expression. So ideas are not copyrights, but for example, software is copyrightable. Publications are 
copyrightable. Um, music scores and dances are actually copyrightable. Um, nicely, you see, uh, when we develop software, we actually try to release under a really permissive license. Um, if any of you are familiar with software, you might know of the BSD license, which is the Berkeley Software Development License. Um, and just for the fun of it, this is one of the only cases that you see went to court for because you see wanted um, against Microsoft's desire, wanted to make sure that the software that we had developed would be released to everyone. And finally, patents. Patents is a grant of right to exclude others from making, using, and selling your invention in exchange for you teaching it to the public. So it doesn't necessarily give the inventor the right to use the invention yourself. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that I have now developed a car, an entire car, and invented a car. And you have now developed, a, a year later, you have developed a tire that is only and only specific to my car, right? So you're not going to be able to use your tire in my car because I already have the right to make use or sell the car. You won't be able to, but you can get a license or permission from me to actually sell your tire. Um, a patent has a life of 20 years from the date that it is filed, and once it is issued, it is enforceable against others. And finally, we have agreements. Um, so let's say that you have an invention that you have not filed an application for, a patent application for, but being in the science area, and I was basically a scientist for several years, you always know that you know, the idea is half-baked, but you do want to talk about your idea and your invention with others so you can develop it a little more before we want to file a patent application on it. And in that case, I always suggest to do non-disclosure agreements because it makes sure that both parties understand that this um, is an invention, this is a confidential information that we are exchanging with each other, and that we are not going to be talking about it to any others because once um, an idea or an invention is disclosed, then the chances of filing on it in the US are significantly shortened. Uh, basically, we will only have one year to file it in the US and the chances of filing it anywhere else in the world are scrapped, that's it. So, um, you may want to ask, what can be patented? You say, okay, I have an invention. And my very first question is always, what is it, right? Um, and how is it different from what others have? So as far as the patent office is concerned, the US patent office and all the patent offices around the world, an invention is something that, it's some, what can be patented is anything under the sun, modified by a human, that is novel, meaning nobody else has ever done it before. But as we all know, most um, inventions are not that novel, right? Meaning that somebody else has probably done something like it before, but it needs to be non-obvious. Meaning that the, the way you have put together the elements um, are not obvious um, because the elements existed, but the way you put them together, nobody else has done before. And, or even if they have done it, what you have shown is um, that your method of combining them together is so far better than anything anybody else has done that it still counts as non-obvious. And an invention needs to be useful. Meaning that, um, for example, let's say, you cannot make it, since we were talking about cars and tires, you cannot make a tire just to fill a landfill. That cannot be the use for a tire. But to say that, okay, this tire can be used for trucks or for cars, um, that's useful, that's good. I have a question, sorry. Ah, sorry, that's, that's yours, okay. Um, also, a patent must teach a person of, oops, sorry, there you go. A person of ordinary skill in the art on how to make and use the invention. 
And ordinary skill in the art means somebody like yourself. So for example, um, the patent application needs to be detailed enough that if uh, let's say I am in the same field as you are, that I can pick up the patent application, go to my laboratory and recreate your invention. So if you have a new invention or software, what, to, what do you do? Um, what we do ask is to please go, uh, uh, first of all, speak with us. In all of your case, I'm your contact. Please speak with me, um, contact me, and I'm more than happy to speak with you. And also then file a disclosure. The disclosures that we have here belong to um, UC employees. And as capstone students, you, um, you're not a UC employee. However, um, Alex has provided, and I think you have, um, Alex, uh, you have a template that we produced last year together, right, for these inventions. Uh, more than anything else, what we need is the names of the inventors, and I'll, um, I'll be more than happy to discuss what we um, believe inventors are or what the US Patent and Trademark Office believes the inventors are. And um, if there is any funding information aside from um, the, the money that you have already paid uh, to be a student, for example, if you all of a sudden started to work on a project that was government funded, we need that government funding because we have duties to disclose to the government. Um, and then um, tell us about the disclosure. Tell us about the invention. What is it, right? What does it do? How does it work? When we want to do um, uh, filings, and as, as you continue through your career and you have inventions and you want to file applications, the patent application to issuance uh, timeline is a very, very, very long one. It's not that you file a patent application today and by next year you have a patent in your hands. That's almost impossible. So usually um, what happens is uh, we file provisional patent applications first. And in this particular case and for this program, you see we reimburse you for the, the, the winners for the <clears throat> provisional patent application. We have already hired outside counsel that uh, will work with you to file that application. And then you know a year from there, um, you will decide what to do. A provisional application in the eyes of the patent office is a placeholder. Basically, you're telling the patent office, patent office, I have this idea that I'm kicking around, that this invention that I'm kicking around, let's, let's just hold it for one year and then we will see what to do. And then there are a variety of pathways basically to take after that. We can do what is known as international application or a US only application. And in general from, uh, the first provisional to when we actually get an issuance any, is anywhere from five to I'm hoping no more than seven years, but sometimes 10 years I've seen. And I've sort of also put down the costs uh, down there. Um, patents are really, really costly. Uh, we go about them very carefully. And hopefully as you go on in your careers, you will also go about them really carefully and thoughtfully um, when, when you want to uh, protect your assets. When we want to file patent applications, we review for a variety of um, criteria. One of them is the value. Is it a thing, right? Or is it a method? Or is it a fundamental um, invention, meaning that nobody can design around it easily, or is it, or is it very easy to design around? Also, can you detect infringement, right? So let's say that you have created a method of creating, of putting something on a very, very small chip, right? Um, that, and that chip is going to end up, right, in a camera right, in, uh, or in an iPhone or in a cell phone or whatever. But it is so difficult to detect if anybody else whose camera works just as well as yours 
um, is using the exact same technology that you put on the chip, right? We, we, you need to consider that very carefully before moving on and whether you want to go ahead, for example, with that patent application or not. Is it enforceable? Yes or no. And is it actually patentable? Like, is, does it have so many different layers right, in a claim that, that is going to be so difficult for anybody to understand, um, even if it ends up as a patent, it may not really be worth it um, as far as you might be concerned in, as your path continues on. Then um, does it have business value? And that's really, really important because that highlights your unique benefits and commercial potential. Because if the market is not gonna wanna pick it up, then you really will not want to file a patent application or go after patenting, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars because uh, you believe it's important, but um, it may its commercial potential or the market will not be wanting to pick it up easily. Right. Or the market for, let's say, is going to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to emulate or pick up what you want to do with that technology. Then um, the next uh, evaluation would be, is it sound? Is, is it safe? And also, are we in comp compliance with all the legal deadlines? For example, I just I, I just brought up um, if you have disclosed it already, do we really want to file a patent application on it anymore or not? Um, one of the things that I always um, push on people is technology is not the same as need, right? Um, because all competitions are really, really fierce. What you want to highlight in your invention is the unique benefits that your um, invention has and not just an enhancement to a technology that you're bringing on because enhancements to the technology may not prove to be really valuable in the commercial uh, realm. And then one of the, um, the, the, the way that, that we go about st um, strategy in patent filings is what are the strategic roles that these patents will play in your industry, right? So for example, if you, are in the chemicals or instruments industry, right? Or bio or pharmaceuticals, you wanna be monopolizing the, the field, right? You wanna make sure that you're blocking everybody else and you, we, we usually file all over the world. But if you're dealing with software and internet uh, technologies, you just wanna make sure that you are um, leveraging um, when competitors must infringe, right? And so, we may file a lot of patent applications for a product or a system, but we're not gonna go all over the world for it. And you may consider not going all over the world or not prosecuting all over the world for it. And then once you have a patent application um, or a patent, then you may want to think about um, licensing it, right? Um, or using it yourself. If you were to think about licensing it, you might want to think about the different ways of licensing your technology. Uh, one of them would be a letter agreement, which is a very, very simple um, agreement that says, um, I'll give you this technology for a very short period of time, just for you to use, not give it to anybody else, just to see if it works in your hands. Uh, the other one might be for a little bit longer, basically to say, okay, um, I'll give you a time limited right, still work in house, don't give it to anybody else, you don't have the right to sell, but to see if you want to do a little bit further research and development, but this time you have to give me, you have to pony up a lot more money, uh, because by now I have spent a lot of money on my patent application, right? And finally, it's a full-blown license agreement, which you allow another entity to commercially use the intellectual property you have created. If you have software, if you might develop software, um, then there are a variety of ways to license that as well. One of them is the open source license. There is a variety of open source licenses that are either really, really open or really, really restrictive. Um, the other one is a commercial license, straight up commercial licensing or a dual license. Um, I like dual licenses and I, get, and I engage in a lot of them um, because you allow a certain 
category of companies or people to use um, your license freely, but others have to come for a commercial license. And that's it. Do I have any questions? Let me get out of this and stop sharing. So do I have um, questions from, from the group? Let's see. Oh, I can see one. Um, thank you. Okay, how is IP divided between capstone team and the student-led capstone? Is it divided percentage-wise, or, or does the IP always belong to one person? No. So <coughs> ownership um, follows inventorship usually. So let me first step back and um, tell you what an inventor is in the eyes of law, right? An inventor is one who actually conceives at least one claim in the patent, conceives, right? So if you have thought about how to make, for example, or um, let's say you're, you're working on a, um, on a pencil. If you were the one who figured out how to make the pencil and make it work, then you're definitively an inventor. That goes on the claim, right? Let's say you come to me and you say, Lale, I figured out how to make this pencil. Why don't you go ahead in the lab and make this pencil, right? I go ahead in the lab. I, I do exactly as you say, and I don't come up with the pencil that you say, uh, because it just was not, um, it did not, uh, foresee, for example, the size of the opening for the for the carbon head or whatever, right? And I have to go through a lot of work to actually figure that out um, and figure out how the pencil works. Then I also become an inventor. Now, that's that's for inventorship by itself. Um, the next question that comes up is: Let's say that I am now working. You're a capstone student, and you're working with me, one a university employee and we both end up being inventors. So um, if we are the only two, yes, we have 50-50 ownership. So what I do because I'm a university employee, I give my right, I have already given my right to the university. So it becomes 50% um, capstone, 50% university. Um, and then can the partner find a company with a capstone project after? Yes, if it belongs to the university. So let me step back again to answer the next question. So um, we have then let's say a 50-50, right? Uh, with the university and the capstone. Once the year passes after the provisional has, um, has occurred, then we can talk about it because we can enter into an agreement. Uh, usually, if a, um, an entity such as yourself, for example, who are now, let's say, a capstone student who now has started a company, if you want to go ahead with your company, we're not going to interfere. We're just going to sit back. And if you want, we can agree, we can agree to enter into an agreement with each other for um, how we will deal with uh, the technology so that the, the, the university will not take over anything and the capstone student uh, or students can go on with, the, um, with their company. Did I answer your question? Jacob. Okay, awesome. Well, maybe I can follow um, up with a question. Um, so let's say there is a team um, so everyone on the team is an immense student. So there are no university employees on the team. Um, all capstone teams work with an advisor and sometimes, um, sometimes advisors are very involved. Sometimes advisors take more of a back seat. So how would you go about um, thinking when it comes to the advisor's ability to, is the advisor, will the advisor always be an inventor or co-inventor? I think that's my question. Um, the advisor should not always be a co-inventor uh, or an inventor unless the advisor has actually provided uh, to the, or, or um, 
yes, provided concepts that go into the claims, right? The so, so pro inventive concepts, uh, conceptualization. If the advisor has not provided um, inventive conception, or uh, then then the advisor should not be an inventor. Um, Tarek, maybe I could ask you this question. Um, I hope I'm not putting you on uh, on the spot. When uh, you know your your students filed patents in the past, were you were there times when you were not listed on the patent? Maybe Tarek stepped away. So I can tell you that. I, I have a docket of 2000 patent applications and patents at UC. And a lot of times uh, the professors are not, uh, are not inventors. And the professors themselves say that they are not inventors uh, happily. Um, they agree that the students should be the only inventors. Um, and those are, but we're talking about, you know, because we haven't dealt a lot with mechanical engineering students, right? A lot of those are the ones where we're dealing with PhDs and postdocs. And even at that, um, a lot of times the professors just step back. This belongs only to the student. So is this a conversation that students would have with their uh, capstone advisor sometime in the spring as they are preparing to file the paperwork? And what would be the question that they ask? Well, is there a question that they ask or, you know, do they uh, ask the professor to review the or invite the professor to review the documentation um, and then the professor kind of sees that their name's not listed and they have a opportunity to ask why isn't my name listed or I am hoping that this it will be an ongoing conversation between everybody while the project is ongoing instead of at the end, you know, when you write the path, mm -hmm. when you write the disclosure and somebody gets uh, somebody gets surprised, right? We, we sort of don't want that, right? Because surprises are, are no good. Um, the best thing to do would be as you're working on this project together or you know, everybody will have a really good idea of who should or should not be an inventor, how much how much they have um, provided to the conception of this invention, right? Um, and it, you know, God forbid, it, it almost never happens, but God forbid if people start to get into a fight with each other or be, they're unhappy, please come to me, right? Or go to outside counsel. And there's a really, really easy way, right? To figure out, because as I said, inventorship is a matter of law, it's not, just because, you know, it's, it's really diff different from publications, right? In a publication, and, and I've been on both sides, right? Because I was a, a scientist for many, many years, right? In a publication, you write your name, you write your professor's name, you know, you're like the first person, and then the professor is always the last person, and then everybody else in there, including the people who clean up glassware, for example, right? Everybody else's name is there, and you heartily thank everybody else down there, you know, at the, at the bottom of the paper. Um, inventorship is a question of law and only a question of law. Only people who provided a conceptual um, input into the invention are inventors, period. So when we are writing the patent application or where the outside counsel is writing the patent application, um, if there is a hissy between people, what we do is we say, okay, don't worry about it. Here are the claims. Put your name next to the claims that you believe that you actually um, conceived. And if you can't, because you didn't, it, it, the, the idea is that you should, you should really, really be uh, honest, right? If you can't, because you didn't, then that's that. It, it uh, resolves itself really quickly. Okay. Thank you. I think Max has a question next. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. That was very helpful. Um, okay. Let's say if you have a startup idea, and you want to hire people to start working on your concept, how do you make sure um, that you protect your concepts uh, with the people you are hiring? So you enter into, if it's only a concept and you haven't done anything, you will want to enter into non-disclosure agreements with them. Okay, okay. Because that's the most important part because uh, you want to make sure, right, that they are, um 
Yes, and I'm assuming that they're not going to have inventive input, probably, right? Or if they do, then they also become inventors. Okay, I see. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, let's see, Vu. I have some general questions. Okay, do we have to be a part of a capstone project to submit a project? <clears throat> That's an Alex question. So for the competition, um, I, I think that the session is useful. Um, I, I think it's most useful when it comes to recognizing the landscape of intellectual property. Um, so it, it's quite likely that at one point in your career, you will be going through a patent ap application. Um, what we're also, and, and everything that Lala covered is, is, is really important for that process. What we're also talking about is the fast tracking founders program that pays the fees associated with filing a provisional patent. In order to participate in that competition, at this point, you do need to have a capstone project. So if let's say you have a course project, you cannot submit it as a part of the fast tracking founders competition. Or if you have your personal idea, you also cannot submit it. It has to be linked with the capstone project at, at this time. Um, this being said, you know, you know, it's a great question to ask me also at, at a later point um, in the year. Um, the question, the second question, do we need an instructor of record for submission? Um, to some extent, Tarek talked about it and Lala talked about it. The question, you definitely, if you're on a partner-led project, most likely you're not participating in this competition because most likely it involved an NDA, most likely you're already working on um, something that has been patented or is subject to an NDA. If you are on a faculty-led project, I think that the question is whether the instructor of record, which is to say the capstone advisor, made a conceptual contribution to the project. Um, I do think that it's a good idea. And I believe that we ask you whether you told your capstone advisor that you're participating in the project. Um, I, I think or, uh, that you're participating in the competition. I think it's a good practice to um, let them know that you are. Um, and then there is a separate issue of whether or not um, they um, can be a co they are a co-inventor because they made a contribution. And how many projects can we submit individually? Because you have one capstone, I would say you can submit one project. Um, and um, each capstone team can only right. We never had, Lale, theoretically speaking, could we envision a capstone team submitting two patent claims? You can submit as many as you want because I think they're they're ultimately all going through the competition, right? Yeah. Um, you can submit as many as you like, but um, we will at the end only pick up the the winners, right? Yes. And so for per team, we can only do um, one. Uh, hopefully one winner per team, because uh, we would like to give an equal opportunity to all the teams uh, for filing of applications. But if you're super inventive and you feel that your project could lead to two entries or three entries into the competition, hypothetically speaking, you could submit three entries. Does that make sense, Lala? And then one of them could win. Yeah, yeah. also, also, Remember, and, I, and I, this, I, I know this is a um, throwing a, <laughs> a, a, a curveball, but um, if your team includes UC students, right, UC PhD students or postdocs, and the students or postdocs are bent on filing an invention, um, and the invention actually uh, passes muster, right, UC might want to pick it up and file on it. 
and you would still have a name on the patent. Absolutely, you're still an inventor, right? Absolutely. Great. Um, other questions? Please just unmute or raise your hand. Um, I have a question that yeah. has to do with the relationship between inventorship and ownership. Um, so, you know, let's say there is a team of uh, four students and um, there are 10 claims and one student appears in six and then others appear in one. two or one or something, something along the line. The point is some, there is something unequal when it comes to um, contribution to the project. So what happens when it comes to um, ownership? So in the eyes of the law, actually, um, that's irrelevant. Meaning that as long as there are owners from different, so, so let's say that um, just between you and I, Alex, let's just figure, right? Let's say Alex has um, invented, the, the, the application has 10 claims. Alex has invented nine and a half claims and I have invented half of one of the claims. In the eyes of the law, we are equal. And we will be, and Alex belongs to UC Berkeley and I belong to my home. And my home and UC Berkeley become joint owners, 150-50, just equal joint owners, um, which is fine. I think the, the most important part, um, as far as UC is concerned, and as far as UC has ever heard from people, it's not the joint ownership that worries people, it's how much money am I gonna get at the end when we make money? And that's where, so, so and, and as, again, as far as UC is concerned, we will both get equal amounts, but unless, unless you and I want to agree that we would get separate amounts, meaning that if the hundred dollar comes in, that you get ninety nine and a half dollars, right? And I get the 50 cents. And if I agree with it and you agree with it, we're good to go. But we definitively are joint owners. Um, it's not gonna be that um, I have less ownership and you have more ownership. It's just equal ownership. That's, that's um, in the eyes of the US law. Thank you. I will need to ask um, no problem. that if- um, No problem. Okay, of course. <laughs> uh, we'll be happy uh, to share the slides. Um, one last thing I think I, I'll say before we sign off is that the um, invention disclosure form, basically what the patent competition is essentially, or 80% of what you need to submit, this is the invention disclosure form. Um, and um, I will post um, a link um, um, in the chat. And those of you who are joining us online, you could just um, Google Invention Disclosure Firm, UC Berkeley, um, uh, UPIRA. Um, and what I want to say is that the when you look at the disclosure form and you look at the questions, you're going to see how closely um, the questions correlate to um, to the type of questions that you would be um, answer, what you would be writing about in your um, communications class, uh, which is to say in your um, in your final uh, capstone um, report. So this is the um, this is the. Can, can you see my screen? No, I think now you can. Right. Yes. So this is the um, invention disclosure form. And um, if you go on to fill out these disclosures and you have any questions, just knock on my door, meaning just, just send me an email and I'm absolutely more than happy to help out. 
Um, one thing that I want to say is when you're presenting on your capstone to your uh, classmates, that is not considered to be public um, disclosure. Public disclosure is um, the showcase event at the end. So if you're considering participating in the uh, competition or if you are, the deadline for the competition will be before the, uh, the uh, showcase, but probably the results won't be announced. So basically you wanna be careful during the showcase if you are filing a patent. But presentations that you do as a part of your E-295 or E-296 to your capstone advisor, um, that's, um, that, that's okay. Um, I believe that there is a form, there is a part of the uh, form that I now can't find, but I believe that there was where you're asked to come up with, um, uh, with comparable um, uh, comparable patents or patents in the field? I don't think so. We don't ask it's that patent. in oh, disclosure. Great. So maybe I, I ask this. Thank you. But yeah. okay. <laughs> two point, section 2.1, possible commercial applications of the invention 2.2. This is essentially the first part of the capstone report where you're asked to talk about the general possible applications of whatever it is you're working on. So my point is that if you, this thinking about this will help with your final capstone report, writing a final capstone report will help you um, writing this. That's what I wanted to. Yeah. Um, um, so one question is, the projects were listed on EduSource. Would that count as uh, a public disclosure since other companies could look at the project description? Um, actually, they could not look at the project description. Uh, only um, you see, you need, in order to get access to EduSource, you need, you need a, only students, this is why you, you may remember that you had to do CalNet authentication. So only students had access to EduSource. Um, and I believe only students had access to the Google Drive if you did a video recording. And that was not considered, that was not a public event. We did not advertise it. So Lala, would you agree? Yep. Yes, I agree. Yeah. But if you were, let's say, talking to the marketing team um, and you know, getting publicity, this is something to think about. You, you wanna, and Lala, you once formulated this very well. You want to say what you're working on, but not... But not how it works. Exactly. What it is, but not how it works. The how it works is the crux of the invention, and that's what you want to tr try to protect. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and thank you so much, um, Lali, for your time and Tarek for your time. Um, and I very much hope that um, you participate. Yes, I do too. Thank you all. And I'm always available for questions. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.